Good morning. Welcome to the Humanist Community in Silicon Valley Sunday Forum. My name is Matt Courtney. I'm a recorder and a member of the board of the Humanist Community. The Humanist Community is a chapter of the American Humanist Association. Humanism is a reality-based philosophy of life that affirms our ability and responsibility to lead ethical lives of personal fulfillment that aspire to the greater good. We value freedom, health, happiness, fairness, compassion, and using science and reason to acquire and apply knowledge. If these words describe your thinking, we invite you to become a member of the Humanist Community if you have not already done so. Membership forms are available on our website at humanist.org. If you are listening for the first time, welcome, and we invite you to continue listening to our weekly forums and other events. You can find all of our events listed on the website, humanists.org. Please aid us in continuing to present these forums by donating to the Humanist community. You can find out how to donate to our organization on the website, yet again, humanists.org. For Dr. Eugenie C. Scott, who will talk about why Kitzmiller versus Dover should be remembered 15 years later. Dr. Scott has a very long list of achievements that will probably take way too long to uh, uh, cover. So I will let her describe anything that she <laughs> wants in that, that case and introduce uh, her presentation. So go ahead and take it away. All right. We are sharing and Zooming and doing all sorts of exciting things here. All righty. Thank you very much for inviting me to meet with you this morning. I appreciate it. And thanks uh, to those of you who are attending, some from very far away. Hi, Brianna. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate you being interested enough in this topic to uh, spend your Sunday morning with me. Um, I'm Eugenie Scott. As it says on the starter slide there, I'm the founding executive director of the National Center for Science Education, now happily retired but still occasionally uh, giving talks and doing things like this. Uh, why should you pay attention to a 15-year-old trial and its outcome? I believe that Kitzmiller versus Dover had not ended up the way it did. Science education would be very, very different and not in a good way. Uh, but first, some good news. A few months ago in June, uh, the journal Evolution, Education, and Outreach published a report on a national survey of public school high school biology teachers conducted in last year by researchers at Penn State and my colleagues at the National Center for Science Education, yay, uh, Glenn and Ann. Now, previously in 2007, Pletzer and his other colleagues, not my NCSE folks, had published a similar survey of high school biology teachers, finding that only 51% of teachers emphasized evolution was a fact. In other words, treated evolution the way, um, you know, university scientists treat it. 51% is pretty puny. The good news is that in 2019, uh, the current researchers found 67% of teachers emphasizing the scientific consensus. And there's other good news in the study, too, regarding how much uh, time is spent on teaching evolution and so forth. So why do I bring up this study? Well, I might be going a bit beyond the data if I were to say that uh, Kitzmiller versus Dover is the reason why teachers are teaching so much more evolution these days. That I'd like to be able to say that, but I think that's, that's pretty unlikely. But the authors of this um, study highlight that the effect on the adoption of science education standards uh, that are strong on evolution, which they are these days, is very probably a major influence on this salutary effect of 51% up to 67. So I will talk a little bit later about the role of Kitzmiller and the relationship it has to science education standards. But first, Kitzmiller didn't occur in a vacuum. Like pretty much everything else, history affects the present. And the teaching of evolution in the United States has had quite a history. Evolution actually began to enter the high school classroom around the turn of the 20th century, really quite early. Um, and that's 
alas, when we see efforts to ban its teaching beginning. The heyday of the ban evolution period was about 1919 through 1927, which of course includes the 1925 Scopes trial. William Jennings Ryan on the right, Clarence Darrow, Darrow on the left, the most famous legal figures of their day. Tennessee had passed a law forbidding the teaching of evolution. And John Scopes was a Tennessee school teacher tried for having violated this law. The Scopes trial was the inspiration for the play Inherit the Wind, which was several times made into movies, including a wonderful version with Spencer Tracy and Frederick March. But the actual, the actual Scopes trial was even more dramatic than the movie and the play. In the movie, uh, it's presented as this titanic struggle between Brian and Darrow, acting as proxies for modernism and traditionalism. But regardless of the uh, various cultural significance of the Scopes trial, Scopes lost, and the law in Tennessee stayed on the books, and there were anti-evolution laws passed after the Tennessee law. And for much of the public, uh, traditional, even, even if for much of the public, traditionalism and fundamentalism took a beating, evolution quietly slipped out of the textbooks and the high school curriculum and was rarely taught for the next 30 years. Evolution didn't return to the high school biology curriculum until the science education reforms of the Sputnik era in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Now, at this time, the National Science Foundation put money into the development of high school science textbooks that were written by master teachers and professional scientists. They were a whole lot better than their predecessors. These books were cloned by commercial textbook publishers, and evolution re-entered the high school curriculum. And Arkansas still had one of these old Scopes era anti-evolution laws on its books. A 25-year-old high school biology teacher, Susan Epperson, was chosen by the Arkansas branch of the National Education Association to be the plaintiff in what was thought to be just a little housekeeping lawsuit. They, they, they told Susan, no, of course you won't have to go on the witness stand. This is just going to be a paperwork trial because how silly it is here in the early 1960s for us to have this old 1925 flapper era law in our books. Ho, 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 hum, it'll just be cleared up in a hurry. Well, much to their shock, the um, uh, state court um, um, uh, let the law stand, and the law was appealed all the way to the Supreme Court. And Epperson versus Arkansas in 1968 struck down these evolution banning laws. So it was no longer legal to ban the teaching of evolution. The return of evolution to the high school curriculum ushered in the next era of the anti-evolution crusade, the effort to balance the teaching of evolution with some form of creationism. Now, this ran smack into the uh, First Amendment, which I will remind you, for those of you who haven't had high school civics in a while, there are two clauses involving religion in the First Amendment, the Establishment and Free Exercise Clauses. Now, Taken together, what they mean is that public institutions have to be religiously neutral toward religion. Schools are public institutions, so they can neither advance nor inhibit the teaching. They, pardon me. They can neither advance nor inhibit religion. They can teach about religion, but they just can't say, you know, Jesus was right or Muhammad was right. Teaching the Bible to balance evolution obviously was advancement of religion. So these early efforts to balance evolution were struck down pretty readily in the courts. Uh, the early 1960s was when an anti-evolution movement called creation science emerged. Now, creation science, or scientific creationism, is a movement claiming that it's possible to scientifically support a literalist, biblical, special creation view. And the most familiar uh, form is young earth creationism, where the um, universe is viewed to be only thousands of years old rather than billions, and, and that the universe appeared suddenly in its present form over a short time, like six 24-hour days, as in a literal reading of Gen Genesis. But not just these religious views, but that these religious views can be supported through science. Now, they don't actually have scientific evidence for this. Uh, they merely comb through the scientific literature and attempt to find anomalies that they claim disprove or weaken the evidence for evolution. What a judge referred to as a contrived dualism, that there are only two alternatives, evolution on one side, 
creationism on the other, is held by creation science proponents to support their idea that evidence against evolution is positive evidence for creationism. That's going to come back later. Um, but during the 70s and early 80s, legislation was introduced in over 25 states to require the teaching of creation science. Louisiana and good old Arkansas uh, passed such legislation, and the Louisiana ca case went all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court decision Edwards versus Aguilar declared that the adv advocacy of creationism, as in the teaching of creation science, was not constitutional. In striking down the teaching of sectarian religion in public schools, the court also commented that teachers could certainly teach all scientific theories about the origin of humankind. Just, they just couldn't teach religious ones. Now, of course, creationists considered creation science to be a scientific theory, but since it failed in the courts, they then came up with another uh, variety called intelligent design. So even if they couldn't teach creation science, they could accomplish their goals by teaching intelligent design. Now, there's another component to Edwards that's worth talking about, and this is the dissent by Scalia. He wrote that teachers could teach the evidence against evolution, which became another organizing strategy. As I mentioned before, in the context of the contrived dualism, this is exactly what they're talking about. Creationists think dichotomously. There's either evolution or creationism. Teaching the evidence against evolution is what they've been doing all along. So the evidence against evolution strategy was also one creationist seized upon after the Edwards decision, and I will come back to that later. But first, intelligent design. Now, intelligent design is a subset of creation science. It focuses on the idea of design, that there are some natural phenomena that categorically cannot be explained through natural causes. They can only be explained by reference to an intelligence. Now, of course, the intelligence is God, but intelligent design proponents believe that by being a bit less obvious about their religious roots, they would be able to duck the Establishment Clause. But everything found in intelligent design is also found in creation science. And there's nothing in intelligent design that's unique to intelligent design. Actually, we showed that in Kitzmiller. The idea, the basic idea of intelligent design, that nature is too complex for a mindless natural cause, as they put it, to produce, is at the heart of creation science. Now, it is the case that there are claims made by creation science proponents that are not found in intelligent design. You generally don't hear intelligent design people. You, you would rarely, if ever, hear an intelligent design proponent talking about the Earth being young. And they don't talk about um, flood geology uh, creating uh, sedimentary deposits around the world. They, they just ignore all of that. But everything in intelligent design pre-existed in creation science. Intelligent design succeeded remarkably well, obviously not in science, but you know, in the general public, in being taken as a serious criticism of evolution from its appearance in the early 90s through the mid-2000s. Um, there were even were intelligent design proponents who were able to get op-ed pieces published in the Wall Street Journal, which I think if Henry Morris of the Institute for Creation Research had ever got, even gotten close to getting an op-ed piece in the Wall Street Journal, he thought, would have thought he'd died and gone to heaven. After the mid-2000s, however, intelligent design faded, and this brings us to Kitzmiller versus Dover. Now, Dover, Pennsylvania is a small community in south-central Pennsylvania, and the site of a lawsuit in federal district court, Kitzmiller v. Dover, in 2005. Kitzmiller was at the time a very large news story. If we were all in the same room, I would say, how many of you have heard of Kitzmiller? And a whole lot of hands would go up. All the networks and the major print publications covered the case. This is... Uh, uh, the fellow in the middle of all of this is Eric Rothschild, standing next to, in the middle is Eric, on the left is Vic Balchek, um, and uh, behind him is uh, Richard Katzmiller. These were our, our major attorneys for the Katzmiller versus Dover case. Nova produced a two-hour documentary in 2007 that got a Peabody. 
He had also received an award from the American Association for the Advancement of Science for Scientific Journalism. I'm going to be showing a clip, uh, clips from time to time in my presentation from Judgment Day, and I'll let them introduce it. <laughs> In October 2004, a war broke out in the small town of Dover, Pennsylvania. Today, the teachers in a rural Pennsylvania town became the first in the country required to tell students that evolution is not the only theory. It started when the Dover Area School Board passed a policy requiring that its high school science classes include a controversial subject called intelligent design. Proponents of intelligent design claim that many features of living organisms are too complex to have evolved entirely through the natural process of evolution, as Charles Darwin proposed. Instead, they claim some aspects of those organisms must have been created, fully formed, by a so-called intelligent designer. And, advocates contend, intelligent design is a bold new scientific theory with the power to overthrow the theory of evolution. It's scientists debating science based on the evidence, not based on any religious text or authority, and it's clearly, uh, properly the subject of a science class. It's in fact opening the path of inquiry uh, to new ways of thinking about things. Evolution by natural selection is a scientific doctrine, then a critique of that a doctrine is a legitimate part of science as well. The Dover School Board demanded that science teachers read their students a one-minute statement claiming that gaps in the theory of evolution exist and putting forward intelligent design as an alternative. The statement also directed students to an intelligent design textbook called Of Pandas and People that would be made available. But many Dover residents and an overwhelming number of scientists throughout the country were outraged. They say intelligent design is nothing but religion in disguise, the latest front in the war on evolution. The goal of intelligent design is to try to re-Christianize American society. Intelligent design is not anywhere a scientific concept. It's not a field of science. It's not being actively researched by anyone. It's a violation of everything we mean and everything we understand by science. The stage was set for a battle that would pit friend against friend and neighbor against neighbor. It was like we shot somebody's dog. I mean, there was a blow up like you couldn't believe. It was like a civil war within the, the community. There's no question. Before it was over, this battle would land the school board in federal court. No cameras were allowed in the courtroom. So to bring this historic showdown between evolution and intelligent design to light, NOVA has dramatized key scenes from court transcripts. It was a six-week trial in which modern biology was Exhibit A. And hanging in the balance was not just the Dover biology curriculum. The future of science education in America, the separation of church and state, and the very nature of scientific inquiry were all on trial. There had been previous skirmishes over evolution, but the conflict heated up in 2004 when high school biology teachers wanted to get the new edition of the book they had been using, Miller and Levine's Biology. By the way, the Miller, Ken Miller, uh, one of the authors of this book, uh, became one of our most effective expert witnesses. School member Bill Buckingham, he's, he's the one you saw there that, <laughs> that like we shot somebody's dog, very colorful character. Bill Buckingham accused the book of being laced with Darwinism, to which uh, Ken Miller and Joe Levine are happy to uh, confess. Buckingham proposed that uh, the textbook be supplemented with Of Pandas and People, the book that you saw in the clip, which he said would balance evolution in the standard textbook. It would present the view of intelligent design. During the summer of 2004, the board told the science department to read the ID book of Pandas and People and watch and intelligent design video, Icons of Evolution. 
and teachers were unimpressed. They told the board they didn't think the books were appropriate for their classes. They criticized the science, and pedagogically, the books just weren't appropriate for high school students. But in the fall of 2004, the board told teachers that unless they used pandas, they wouldn't get their new textbooks. It was a hostage situation. By the way, this is extremely rare for a school board to engage in this kind of micromanaging of the actual textbooks used by teachers. Teachers continued to resist, although attempting to compromise where they could, but the board was relentless. It passed a policy in October 2004 that read, <clears throat> students will be made aware of gaps slash problems in Darwin's theory and other theories of evolution, including but not limited to intelligent design. The next month, teachers notified the board that they were unwilling to treat ideas equal to evolution and that if the board wanted teachers to teach ID, they'd better be more specific. As described by biology teacher Jennifer Miller, who's the lower right-hand woman in the front row there, the board countered by telling teachers they had to read a statement to students before beginning any <laughs> lesson on evolution, which you saw in the clip. The statement was four paragraphs that denigrated evolution and suggested that intelligent design was an alternative. The teachers then did something incredibly brave. They refused to read the statement. And I think at the time, only the department chair, Bar Bertha Spar, the lady in the far uh, left of the front row, only Bertha had tenure. Uh, most of them were young, untenured, able to be fired at the board's whim, but they all stuck together, which was really cool. In summary, although the teachers tried very hard to get the board to compromise on the textbook and the ID policies, and many parents and other citizens protested at school board meetings for months, the board was just recalcitrant. They refused to budge, and the only recourse was a lawsuit. Believe me, this was not something that NCSE was looking for. Um, we have worked very, very hard to solve problems behind the scenes in school district after school district around this country. If you, in one sense, if you have to go to court, you failed because you have failed to resolve your problem. But this school board was, was unapproachable, essentially. And we'd been working with citizens in the uh, community and we teamed up with others to challenge the Board of Education in Federal District Court. Our team consisted of NCSE, uh, Americans United for Separation of Church and State, the ACLU, and a large law firm based in Philadelphia, Pepper Hamilton, where one of NCSE's legal advisory committee members was a partner. We filed on December 18, 2004. The trial began in September of 2005. 10 very long and hard and exhausting months later, the trial took place over six weeks. On the other side was the Thomas More Law Center from Michigan, whose motto is the sword and shield for people of faith, led by Richard Thompson. Now, why couldn't we just go to the judge and say, judge, this intelligent design policy is really bad science. Tell the school board they can't do it. It's because there's nothing in the Constitution that says uh, it's, it's illegal to teach bad science. You can teach bad science all you want. It's not a legal issue. Uh, the Establishment Clause, however, says that public institutions can't advance religion. So what we had to do was show the judge that the school board was advocating religion by requiring the teaching of intelligent design. Because the bottom line was the constitutional issues, what the defense's lawyers, the other guys, had to do was demonstrate that teaching intelligent design was being done for a secular, for a pedagogical reason, not for a religious reason. Now, they also had to demonstrate that intelligent design was valid science. It was okay if intelligent design has religious implications. After all, evolution has religious implications, but it's still a solid science, so you teach it. So they had to try to follow that model as well. Uh, further, they had to show that evolution is questionable science, uh, which would make a stronger case for teaching intelligent design. Anticipating their approach, we needed to show that an intelligent design, on the contrary, was religion that it was a form of creation science. Now, remember that the Supreme Court had previously declared 
1987 that it was not constitutional to teach creation science. So if we could show that intelligent design was nested within creation science, like that diagram I showed you earlier, then we'd win. But we also had to show that there was no valid secular reason for teaching ID. And the reason why they couldn't argue that it was good pedagogy to teach ID is because it wasn't science. It required supernatural intervention, which is outside of science. The only intelligence they're talking about is God, regardless of whatever hand-waving they do about information theory and the rest. And we wanted to show that intelligent design was factually wrong. When they do make fact claims, they're just wrong. And what possible pedagogical reason could there be for teaching kids incorrect information? We also knew we had to uh, defend evolution, to demonstrate the validity of evolution as a scientific idea, because the Dover policy claimed evolution was weak. Remember that gap slash problems in Darwin's theory. We began with a scientist, Ken Miller, the author of that textbook. We ended with a scientist, the University of California's Kevin Padian, <clears throat> for a very good reason. We wanted to signal to the judge that we thought science was important, and we wanted the judge to consider science in his decision. It would have been possible to decide this case only on the religion, First Amendment, constitutional issues, but for us, this was a big package. And as it happened, the other side also wanted to try the science. So we actually didn't have a problem, uh, as had <laughs> the Forrest Scopes team, uh, with getting scientific information into the court. There was a lot of science presented to the judge. It was like the biology class you wish you could have taken, as Margaret Talbot said in The New Yorker. At the end of the first day of testimony, um, after hearing uh, Ken Miller expound on cell biology with great enthusiasm, and if you've ever heard Ken, he's really enthusiastic. He's really a lot of fun to, to listen to. Uh, the judge kind of sat back and said, class dismissed, but in a good way. Perhaps Darwin's great-great-grandson, Matthew Chapman, who attended the trial, said it. To watch the whole thing, you got an education in what evolution was, where evolution stands as a theory now in the 21st century. If you concentrated, you would get sucked into this thing and the day would go by and you'd come out and you'd think, that was amazing what I heard here. And these eloquent people, you know, with these incredible educations and it was fantastic. As NCSC prepared for the Dover trial, obviously we were consultants to the legal team. We had to teach the lawyers a whole bunch of science and bring them up to speed on the history and the nature of the controversy that they were dealing with. We scoured our archives and we found a Students for Origins research article from 1981 reporting that the Foundation for Thought and Ethics was preparing a biology textbook. This textbook was described as being, quote, sensitively written to present both evolution and creation while limiting discussion to scientific data. This, of course, is vintage creation science, right? They claim they can demonstrate the truth of special creationism through science. Now, the Foundation for uh, um, Thought and Ethics um, textbook was, didn't appear for several years. They, they were looking for a secular publisher rather than a religious publisher, and they had a lot of trouble finding one. But FTE also was the publisher of Pandas and People. And so we figured that the book being referred to back here in 1981 was, in fact, the ancestor of Pandas and People, uh, the book that you saw at the heart of the Kitzmiller trial. If some of these early manuscripts were available, they might show the link between intelligent design and creation science that we needed to show. And when we found this clipping, we uh, sent it to the lawyers and said, look what we found. We think this may be the ancestor. Wouldn't it be great if we could get manuscripts? And by that afternoon, the, judge, the lawyers had decided to subpoena any manuscripts from the Foundation for Thought and Ethics. And to their credit, to their credit, FTE coughed them up. They didn't find a shredder someplace. They did the ethical thing. 
Now, there must have been a lot of disappointment in the halls of the Foundation for Thought and Ethics because these early manuscripts made the point very clearly that intelligent design was just repackaged creation science. So this is kind of fun stuff, so I'm going to walk you through it a little bit. On the x-axis are the manuscripts arranged by date, 1983 Creation Biology, 1986 Biology and Creation, Biology and Origins, 1987, all with very much creation science sounding names, right? They changed to the uh, title Pandas and People in 1987, and there are two versions of Pandas and People, version one and version two here, and then Pandas and People finally was published in 89, and there's a second edition in 93. We got these manuscripts, we scanned them all, and my colleague Wes Ellsbury wrote a computer script to count words and compare phrases in the manuscripts, and we were able to show that, yes, indeed, creation biology begat biology and creation begat biology and origins. This was a sequence of the same manuscript through time. It's, it's not a, a rare kind of thing to do with texts. Well, we found that the inclusion of the word creation and cognates, creationism, creationist, etc., and the phrase intelligent design and cognates changed over time, shall we say. The red line is the number of times the term creationist or cognates occurs, the blue the number of times the phrase intelligent design occurs. Note that the lines cross between the two 1987 drafts. Now, students, you will recall from an earlier part of this talk, that in 1987, the Supreme Court Edwards versus Aguillard struck down the teaching of creation science. Probably wasn't coincidental that that's when they changed the words away from creation and creationism, etc. It certainly appears as if the authors changed the phrasing and kept the same ideas. To drive home the point more Clearly, we made comparisons of sections of various drafts, including a very interesting paragraph. Now, in Biology and Creation 1986, there is a phrase, creation means, sorry, excuse me, creation means that the various forms of life began abruptly through the agency of an intelligent creator, with their distinctive features already intact, fish with fins and scales, birds with feathers, beaks, and wings. This wording remains the same through Biology and Origins, 1987. It's also present in the first draft of the book of Pandas and People, the creation language is used. Note that, again, this is 1987, which is the year that the Supreme Court struck down the teaching of creation science as unconstitutional advocacy of religion. In the second draft of Pandas and People, the text changes to intelligent design means the various forms of life began abruptly through an intelligent agency with their distinctive features already intact. Fish with fins and scales, birds with feathers, beaks and wings. I have a feeling that the, you know, the, the, the press walked out of the courtroom that day giggling about fish with fins and scales, birds with feathers, beaks and wings. We certainly were giggling. It is probably not coincidental that this change followed the Supreme Court decision. There's another fun story to tell, and I apologize because it does make my talk a little bit longer, but it's really fun. Please bear with me. In the 1983 creation biology draft, this phrase occurs. Evolutionists think the former is correct. Creationists conclude the latter is correct. The 1986 biology and creation draft has pretty much the same phrase. Evolutionists think the former is correct, creationists accept the latter view. This wording is also maintained in the first draft of the book entitled Pandas and People in 1987. Evolutionists think the former is correct, creationists accept the latter view. This change, however, in the second post-Supreme Court decision of Pandas and People, evolutionists think the former is correct, could design proponentists accept the latter view? I pause because you're giggling, uh, <laughs> because it is really funny. This is not only a lesson in how not to use block and paste, it also is a wonderful missing link between creationism and ID. A could design proponentists is, uh, is, if you Google that, you will find a lot of references uh, on the internet because it really was such a, a wonderful thing to discover. 
However, we did not use this in the trial. It is something that we found in the archives, but the lawyers decided they had already hammered the changing word and wording and drafts of pandas and people so much that, as my uh, uh, staff member Nick Motsky once said, it would be like pouring salt into the wound when the wound was decapitation. A little gory, but true. So the design proponentists was part of Kitzmiller is an urban legend. It was not part of the trial. The story is true. This is in the manuscripts, but we didn't use it in the trial. It was tempting, though. Now, all of our scholars and scientists, including John Haught, the theologian, presented a cogent description of how science is done and why intelligent design doesn't fit the picture. They all talked about science being methodologically naturalistic. Science is restricted to explaining through natural causes. Every one of our witnesses made this point. Now, of course, intelligent design claims that there is no natural explanation for complex or improbable natural phenomena and posits this intelligence, which obviously can only be God, is the only explanation, which kind of puts them outside of science if you understand methodological naturalism. We also stress that real science requires testing of explanations and that intelligent design proponents were not doing this. They were not doing any testing of their explanations. They all discussed peer review, that uh, your scientific explanations have to be run by your academic peers, and that intelligent proponents had not subjected their views to scholarly peer review, preferring, interestingly enough, the, the first publication in intelligent design was a high school biology textbook. I mean, they're obviously going straight to the public. They're not even attempting to convince the scholarly community. <clears throat> Similarly, intelligent design proponents don't publish articles in the scientific literature where intelligent design is used to explain nature. And as a result, intelligent design ideas had not entered the scientific or any other scholarly consensus, whether uh, philosophical or historical or educational or anything else. These guys were outside of anything that you could consider scholarship. So we hit the science very hard, but we didn't win the case totally upon the science or even entirely upon the science. Remember that we needed to show that intelligent design was religious, which we did through looking at the history and so forth and that the school board had religious intent for passing the policy. And we got help from the actions of school board members themselves, who, among other things, had made religious arguments during several school board meetings discussing textbooks and the intelligent design policy. School board members denied a religious intent. Oh, no, nothing, nobody, only secular purpose here, folks. And because they obviously had to make that argument, uh, it was essential that there be a secular purpose. Somehow or another, recordings of school board meetings just mysteriously disappeared. So testimony became a he said, she said sort of thing with school board members denying making religious statements and reporters and others claiming they did. Defense witness William Buckingham and Alan Bonzel also did not endear themselves to the judge when it became clear that they had been at least evasive and at worst lied under oath during their depositions. When deposed, both Bonzel and Buckingham claimed that they had no idea where money to purchase 60 copies of Pandas and People came from. And actually, Mr. Buckingham had solicited money from members of his church for the purpose of buying and donating the books to the high school. We had a check written by Mr. Buckingham to Mr. Bonzel's father, Donald Bonzel, who purchased the books. Under cross-examination during the trial, both Bonzel and Buckingham dodged and weaved and ended up infuriating the judge. He was so annoyed, actually had even stopped the trial to himself question the witnesses, which is a very unusual thing. And it made the jaws drop on lawyer, from lawyers on both sides of the, of the argument. You can read about this if you uh, go to NCSE's website, and you can get the transcript of the whole trial. And it was pretty dramatic. A real turning point uh, in the case was the discovery of some footage from a local television statement where school board member William Buckingham admitted that his intent was to balance evolution with creationism. 
Now, on the witness stand, Buckingham tried to claim that he was just trying very hard not to see creationism, but it just slipped out. He claimed that it was a deer-in-the-headlights ambush by a reporter. I'll let you decide if he appears ambushed and whether there is a deer in the headlights. The book that was presented to me for biology was laced with Darwinism from the beginning to the end. William Buckingham is head of the curriculum committee for the Dover School District. He's also a board member. He strongly believes creationism needs to be taught in the classroom. My opinion that the uh, it's okay to teach Darwin, but you have to balance it with something else, such as creationism. Somehow or another, he doesn't look very, very uh, ambushed. So what happened? Well, I'm not letting anything out. Uh, you know how it ended. Science won, intelligent design lost. And that little gray-haired lady in the corner is grinning for a very good reason. It was a huge victory. On December 20th, 2005, Jones sent out his opinion by email. I went to work that day. We pretty much knew it was going to be out by noon. Um, so I waited at work for a phone call. The decision came across the computer. I think it was 1037. The columnist behind me, I was reading it from the beginning, and he's standing over my shoulder, and he yells at me, Go to the end! Go to the end! I remember Mrs. Spar, Bertha Spar, knocking on my door and interrupting my class. The 139-page opinion ruled that intelligent design is not science. Finding it had been introduced for religious reasons, Judge Jones decided it was unconstitutional to teach intelligent design in Dover science classes. Both defendants and many of the leading proponents of intelligent design make a bedrock assumption which is utterly false. Their presupposition is that evolutionary theory is antithetical to a belief in the existence of a supreme being and to religion in general. To be sure, Darwin's theory of evolution is imperfect. However, the fact that a scientific theory cannot yet render an explanation on every point should not be used as a pretext to thrust an untestable alternative hypothesis grounded in religion into the science classroom or to misrepresent well-established scientific propositions. The citizens of the Dover area were poorly served by the members of the board who voted for the intelligent design policy. Citing what he called the breathtaking inanity of the school board's decision, he found that several members had lied to cover their tracks and disguise the real purpose behind the intelligent design policy. The crushing weight of the evidence indicates that the board set out to get creationism into science classrooms and uh, intelligent design was simply the vehicle that they utilized to do that. The judge also granted the plaintiffs $2 million in, in court cost, which I suspect made a lot of school districts swallow hard when thinking about passing similar policies. As it happened, the lawyers not wanting to bankrupt this little district cut it down to $1 million, and that helped a lot. But no, nonetheless, that's a big fun. Now, remember, alas, that Dar uh, Kitzmiller wasn't appealed. The school board election in the November of 2005 voted the rascals out. And uh, the new board, which included one of the Dover plaintiffs, actually, didn't support the old law, didn't want the expense of appealing it. Uh, it would have been a wonderful case to appeal. But, you know, unfortunately, we didn't get that opportunity. But even if the decision is precedent only in the middle district of Pennsylvania, it's been highly influential mostly in terms of things that didn't occur. What was the effect of Kitzmiller then? Well, the Kitzmiller decision was so strong, so solid, and so thorough that the thought of requiring the teaching of intelligent design was shelved by intelligent design proponents. This doesn't mean that intelligent design disappeared, but the balance strategy faded fairly quickly. To see what came next in the anti-evolution movement, let me take you back to the Edwards decision. Remember that in dissent to Edwards banning the teaching of creation science, Scalia believed that teachers could teach the evidence against evolution. 
If you recall the contrived dualism thinking of creationist, evidence against evolution is evidence for creationism. Therefore, this decision fit very nicely into the creationist mindset. Even if creationism and then later intelligent design was not constitutional to teach, much the same effect could be achieved by teaching the evidence against evolution. This brings us to the third and current historical stage of anti-evolutionism, belittling evolution. The uh, band balance and belittle, by the way, is uh, Glenn Branch's uh, creation. He's much better with words than I am, and most people. The contention here is to teach evolution because you have to, but also teach that evolution is weak science, so it's discredited. In the current belittling period, religious issues are downplayed. The courts have spoken, so creationists need to present an approach that doesn't look like it's religion, they know that they'll lose if it does. Catchphrases associated with this wave include theory, not fact, teach the controversy, academic freedom, evidence for and evidence against, strengths and weaknesses, critical analysis. And by the way, I have to point out, critical, critical analysis doesn't actually mean critical analysis. It means criticize. Uh, and this is clear in the comments of the of the various legislators who have proposed such legislation. And again, you know, most people I think te think dichotomously just like creationists do. Belittling evolution actually supports creationism. And proponents of this uh, belittling approach make a pedagogical argument as well. It's good for students to practice their critical thinking skills by looking at all the evidence. There's an interesting shift from balancing to belittling, illustrated by my friend and former NCSC colleague, Nick Motsky. Now, over the years, some very remarkable people have worked at NCSC, and one of whom is Nicholas Motsky, who went on to become Dr. Nicholas Motsky, evolutionary biologist, now a professor at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. Nick published a paper a few years back that nicely illustrated the change from balancing to belittling. He took an NCSC database of the texts of legislation submitted since, 19, since 2004 and analyzed it as one might analyze a group of fossils or DNA evidence or some other evolutionary system. He broke the text into phrases and traced how the phrases were repeated or not through the temporal sequence of bills, much as one might take morphological or biochemical characteristics of fossils or living species, and trace relationships among them through time. Applying some standard phylogenetic techniques, he was able to show ancestor and descendant relationships among these bills, and also changes in strategy over time. Let me show you how this works, because it's kind of cool. He traces the evolution of these bills from 2004 to 2015. Um, time runs along the bottom from early to recent. At the left is 2004. At the right is 2016. The bills themselves are indicated at the end of the branches. So this is a South Dakota bill from 2014. Here's an Iowa bill from 2009. The ancestor of all these bills is a group of bills originating in Alabama in 2004. In 2004, a group of bills collectively called academic freedom bills began to appear and spread. They promote the teaching of creationism in the guise of protecting a teacher's academic freedom to teach all the evidence, or more commonly, the full range of scientific views. The latter phrase came from a sense of the Senate amendment to the 2001 No Child Left Behind Education Act put forth by Senator Santorum, ironically of Pennsylvania. The Santorum Amendment was written by intelligent design proponent, UC Berkeley law professor Philip Johnson, whom you saw in one of the um, Judgment Day clips. Under the guise of teaching the full range of scientific views, teachers would be encouraged to teach the alternative scientific view called intelligent design. The belief was that since scientific views are legitimately taught, intelligent design should be taught as it's part of the full range of scientific views. The other approach running through these bills is that they're permissive. Rather than requiring teachers to do A or B, they allow teachers to bring in the full range of scientific views, which is done for legal reasons. It's a whole lot harder to bring a challenge on the face of the law when you have wording like this. 
Later in the 2000s, the Scalia evidence against evolution position began to be emphasized in legislation where a new generation of bills called Science Education Acts were more explicit about teachers teaching strengths and weaknesses of evolution and similar wording reflecting supposed evidence against evolution. Here they are together. The blue are the Academic Freedom Acts, the full range of scientific views, and the green are the Science Education Act, strengths and weaknesses. Now there's, of course, overlap. The academic freedom wording didn't go away in one year. But the full range of views encouraging the teaching of intelligent design seemed to largely fade away in the mid-2000s, the last gasp of the balancing strategy. They were replaced by Scalia's evidence against evolution, or strengths and weaknesses on this chart. I think the reason for this was that Kitzmiller so soundly trashed intelligent design that the full range of scientific views found in the Academic Freedom Acts was no longer tenable. Creationists had gone from teaching the Bible to teaching creation science to teaching intelligent design, and there wasn't much else they could do to wash religion out of their position. Failing to get some sort of creationism into the classroom, they shifted to attacking evolution, the belittling strategy. After about 2006, there are precious few ID bills that pop up in this sequence. Legislating the teaching of ID clearly fell out of favor. But what if Kitzmiller had declared intelligent design was actually a scientific alternative to evolution and thus legal to teach? What if we had lost in Kitzmiller? I put together a little graphic showing the states that I think would have been candidates for passing ID-friendly legislation. Red is where is states where Academic Freedom or Science Education Act legislation has been introduced, not necessarily passed, most didn't. Pink is states where intelligent design-friendly legislation has been introduced at some time in the recent past. And there's not a lot of states left. If Kitzmiller versus Dover had gone the other way, I think it's safe to say that these states and districts would have skipped the effort to pass academic freedom or science education type legislation and gone straight to introducing pro-intelligent design legislation. No sense in playing games with strengths and weaknesses when you can teach the real thing. There are many local school districts around the country also that have flirted with intelligent design and likely would have passed Dover-style policies despite what happened at the state level. The trickle-down for Kitzmiller would have had serious consequences in other ways as well. Another consequence would have been in the writing and adoption of state science education standards. If intelligence is declared legal to teach, there would have been considerable pressure throughout states to include ID and possibly other creationist ideas in state science education standards. The Next Generation Science Standards, or NGSS, is an advisory set of standards that states can adopt if they want to. Now remember, the United States has an incredibly decentralized education system. We don't have a, natu a national curriculum. We don't have national standards, really. We have the NGSS, which is a national advisory standards. They're not mandatory. Take them or leave them. The National Academy of Sciences developed a framework from which uh, another nonprofit working with several states' educational leadership wrote the NGSS. Now, the NGSS would not have advised the teaching of anything other than evolution, straight up. It would have not, no balancing, no strengths or weaknesses, none of that nonsense. This is, after all, the National Academy. In fact, one of the disciplinary, disciplinary core ideas <clears throat> is biological evolution, colon, unity, and diversity. It's right there as a major factor in the NGSS. But that doesn't mean that states would have had to accept the NGSS. And if intelligent design had been legal to teach, there would have been considerable pressure to modify the NGSS at the state level to decrease the emphasis on evolution before adoption. And this is where I want to come back to that NCSE Penn State study I started off with. If the NGSS had not been adopted as widely as it had, would teachers be teaching as much evolution? I doubt it. The responsibility of teachers is to teach the curriculum of their district. Academic freedom isn't a thing at the K-12 level. I don't think we would be seeing this improvement in teachers teaching evolution if Kitzmiller had gone the other way because standards in the various states would not be as strong on evolution as we see them. And standards govern instruction. St 
standards also largely govern the content of textbooks. Let's not forget what happens to textbooks when states say, teach X instead of Y. The publishers salute smartly and give them the books they want, because they want to sell books, right? If state standards were ID friendly, you can count on textbooks including the subject as well as publishers write books that will sell in a market including the teaching of intelligent design. So intelligent design would have the imprimatur of an official looking textbook purchased by the school district. Kitzmiller stopped efforts to require the teaching of intelligent design, but it did not stop the anti-evolution movement. There's no shortage of anti-evolution and anti-science education activity in the United States these days. Most of these bills from last year <clears throat> object to the teaching of evolution, climate change, or both. And there's a new kid on the block. Some of these bills are stop K-12 indoctrination bills. This is a David Horowitz associated group promoting a code of ethics, restricting teachers from, quote, advocating for any issue that is part of a political party platform at the national, state, or local level. And guess what topic in science education has cropped up in state party and even the National Republican Party at uh, various times, plat uh, platforms, and that is evolution and climate change. Intelligent design was an effort to mask creationism so that it could be taught in state schools. The anti-evolution effort continues in state and local policies, in state standards disputes, and is pressure on teachers in many parts of the country. That said, it would have been much worse if Kitzmiller had gone the other way. We owe a lot to Kitzmiller versus Dover. And to John E. Jones III, a Republican practicing Christian judge who has admitted to having no more than a liberal arts education in science, who listened with an open mind to the science, the philosophy, the theology, and the history, and applied the law fairly. And in my opinion, and the opinion of the science community, came to the correct decision about intelligence design's unsuitability for the public school classroom. So thank you, Judge Jones. And thank you for listening to my talk this morning. Everybody's clapping, but uh, we're all muted. So um, if you Thank have any you. questions, I guess we're going into Q&A right now. I um, already got a hand up. So start with Roy and Susan. Go ahead. Yes, I got a comment about uh, why we may be here or we shouldn't be here. Uh, uh, Professor Tyson, who is both an uh, atomic physicist, nuclear physicist, and a cosmologist, uh, discusses the physical uh, parameters, like the charge of electron, the action of uh, electricity and magnetism and all the good stuff. There seems to be a, one parameter that if it had changed just a few parts out of 10 with 28 zeros, we will not be here, and I'm a little scared that maybe uh, the creation people would say, that's what God did, is fix that uh, parameter so that it made us here. So, any comments on that? Uh, yes, precisely. The, um, uh, the intelligent design, as well as the traditional young earth creationist, both sees on the cosmological constants, that's the phrase for those kinds of numbers that you were talking about. Um, yeah, they definitely, uh, they definitely uh, believe that that is the evidence for the hand of God. Um, might be, but, you know, it's sort of like, I would not be here if a particular sperm from my father had not fertilized a particular sperm from my mother. Maybe a different sperm would have fertilized a different egg and somebody else would be here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I, I just, I've never really, I've never really understood the gestalt behind the cosmological constant argument that this was somehow, you know, a, a design argument for the existence of God. If the universe uh, did not have the particular characteristics that it has in terms of, of you know, size and 
all those constants that you mentioned and that um, uh, Tyson talks about and other cosmologists, then it'd be a different universe. Yes, parallel. <laughs> Maybe, maybe there's a whole, you know, maybe the multiverse, uh, I, I don't know crap about physics. I mean, you know, if I, if I speak more than 20 words about physics, it becomes really clear that I don't know anything about physics. But maybe there's a lot of different universes that only vary uh, from ours by a, a small amount. I mean, and we just happen to be in this one. It's, yeah, but, but you are correct that the, um, yeah, that is one of the design arguments that the, uh, uh, proponents of intelligent design are very fond of thank you and we all stay tuned <laughs> yes indeed yes indeed okay uh i got a couple more hands up but uh, i just wanted to throw out a comment from the chat on zoom from david i thought was pretty funny it says uh, i think we should make it interesting and balance out intelligent design with the story of xenu from scientology <laughs> Yeah, it's yeah, that's interesting. You know, the <laughs> the um, as an anthropologist, I think that Americans not only are maybe not as scientifically literate as they ought to be, they also are not very theologically literate. I really wish that our fellow citizens would know. As a humanist, I really wish our fellow citizens knew a lot more about religion than they do. Uh, we tend to be very parochial. We tend to know part of the own religion that we are, are practicing and not about the you know the varieties even within our own religion much less many other religions so i have often uh suggested that we should have comparative religion classes taught at the upper level high school uh at the upper you know junior senior level in high school where kids are old enough to you know understand these issues and talk about the history and talk about the the tenets and the comparisons and the role of religion in human society, which is extremely important, et cetera, et cetera. The creationists don't want any of that. The creationists don't want any of that. They have strongly opposed any kind of comparative religion out of the fear that their views, which they believe are the correct views, are going to be presented just as one of a variety of choices that people have, which of course they are. You know, we understand that as humanists. But that's not their position at all. And they feel that their, their children would be confused by this idea that there are other options. And, I mean, I've, <laughs> just as an aside, have you ever noticed in high school, you get sociology, economics, uh, sometimes you get philosophy, uh, very, very rarely, history obviously, very rarely do you ever get an anthropology class in high school. And I think the reason for that is twofold. Number one, in, anthrop in anthropology, you get evolution. You, you can't miss it because, you know, anthropology is ultimately an evolutionary field. And number two, you understand from cultural anthropology that human beings all over this planet have religious views, all of which they believe are just as correct as you believe your religious views are correct and that kind of relativism scares the hell out of a lot of americans who don't want their kids to be exposed to that so there is a great deal of opposition to the teaching of anthropology at the k-12 level you have to wait until you get into college before you find out these things but the creationists do not want xenu or <laughs> any other religion talked about if, if you can really call um, scientology a religion that we, we could probably have another talk about that at some point, but you know, <laughs> right. they, they are not at all uh, interested in comparative religion being presented. And you, also, you also have to include the flying spaghetti monster in that uh, comparative yeah. religion, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have uh, Celso who's been waiting. Oh. Right. We have a little issue with the unmute. Hopefully be able to hello there we go hi yeah i just wanted to raise exactly that uh that question of the uh flying invisible spaghetti monster that was put <laughs> forth as a uh, as a scientific theory put put forth by uh, an actual physicist of course in jest but uh just to um you know muddy the works 
Yeah, it was actually put forth as a specific um, elbow in the ribs to the intelligent design folks. Right. Uh, I think it was from Kansas, was he? Was I think he was a graduate student. At any rate, it's taken on a life of its own, clearly. But you know, I mean, religion is an important. Uh, it, it, it's a serious topic, and it's a it's an important topic. And you know, you you can have fun with it. I know religious people who get a kick out of the uh, flying spaghetti monster as well. And may his noodly tentacles uh, bless you. All right. Uh, hold on. Here we have Herman. Herman Winnick. Are you awake? Herman, where are you? Uh -oh. There he is. No, he's okay. <laughs> okay. There he goes. I'm, un I'm muted now. Um, Thank you for that wonderful talk. I'm surprised, however, that you didn't mention what I think is the most, the strongest argument against intelligent design, which is that no intelligent designer would wrap the prostate around the urethra. Anyway, I think I've mentioned that in previous forums. <laughs> well, I didn't, th this was not a talk about the flaws of intelligent design. Uh, the the other classic, uh, that's another whole talk in and of itself. I can go on, uh, I can wax for quite a long time about uh, the problems with intelligent design. But, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll up you, 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 you pledge one prostate, I raise you one urethra. Um, you know, what intelligent designer would put, as, this, as the saying goes, a waste disposal site in the middle of a recreation area? <laughs> Okay, we have uh, Senna and Alex. Yes, well, first a comment about the, the urethra and, and so on. I, I think the, the, the thing is God just has a cruel sense of humor. But I wanted to ask you about the, the idea that the school should not take up um, issues that are important to a political party. That seems to cover an awful lot. It covers, covers global warming and, and uh, how contagious viruses are, and, and a lot of them. Am I still muted? Oh, you're yeah, on. Good. We can hear you. You're fine. Um, I, 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 so, I guess my question is, are these uh, legislations being seriously proposed? And <clears throat> I, you know, I'm, I have not kept up uh, the last few years with the uh, success and, or failure of these uh, these bills. Um, NCSC would would have more information about that. Um, but yeah, they are, they are they are proposed seriously. There's no question about that. I don't know where or if any have been passed, but certainly they're they're very very ill advised. The, these are, as you pointed out, uh, there's so many goofball things that show up in political party platforms that you really don't want them influencing the uh, curriculum of any any school. Thank you. Okay, we have Ray. These are a little... Uh, okay, I am muted now. Yep. Uh, thank you for your talk. I enjoyed it. And wanted to touch basis on your comment on comparative religion education. I think that this is something that would have benefited me when I was in high school or even earlier. Uh, and I think that this could be one of the best methods to re eliminate religious belief entirely. You know, I, I don't have an opinion on that, but I do believe that um, we need we need more understanding of of religion and what it does to and for human beings. Um, you know, I, I'm a humanist like all of you, and uh, I think we tend to focus on the bad things that come out of religion. Um, and it's true. I mean, wars and mistreatment of individuals and groups and so forth and so. On. I mean, there's many, many bad things that have been done in the name of religion. 
it also has been and continues to be uh, a motivating force for considerable good. You know, my, my daughter, a number of years ago uh, in high school, uh, volunteered for one of these um, social action programs that uh, Berkeley High was encouraging the students to do, you know, to, to give back to the community, etc. And uh, she went down very early on Saturday morning to help unload food from the food trucks for the food bank. And uh, she came back after a couple of weekends of this, and she said, you know, Mom, all of the people there unloading food with me were from churches. You know, I thought, well, good for them. I mean, you know, humanists ought to be down there unloading the, the, the trucks as well. <laughs> you know, we have the same kind of, you know, we have the social gospel if nobody else does. <laughs> we certainly I don't disagree with that at all. I was a religious person a good part of my life and saw a lot of good things from the religion I was involved in. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we did a lot of volunteer type things and so on. Yeah. Uh, but the problem with religion is all the bad that it causes when different religions fight over their beliefs. Or which is why I think, which is why I think a, a better... ...tries to control people. Which is why I think a better understanding of religion from an anthropological perspective, shall we say, I mean, really understanding the role of religion in human societies cross-culturally would help to ameliorate some of those. You might still believe that your, you know, your explanations are the best, but uh, I have a feeling that if you really understood more about religion, whether in, as, as you suggested, it would cause the, um, uh, the, the withering away of religion, it would certainly make you more tolerant of other people's views. That's a hypothesis. I guess we could test it. But yeah. I think that if we could get beyond religion and all of the good of all the various religions could still be a part of humanity through humanism or some other non-supreme being mm -hmm. kind of thinking. Yeah, it's interesting. We um, can evolve a lot faster. I just, I've got my computer kind of propped up so that I'm looking at it straight on as one is supposed to do when one gives a talk, so it's a little bit tippy here. Um, yeah, I mean, as, as humanists, I think we're concerned that you know, we leave, we leave this planet a little bit better than we came into it, whether that's, you know, greener or more just or um, healthier or kinder, whatever. Uh, and, you know, let's, let's choose, uh, this is certainly a Unitarian position, but it's also a, a, a humanist position. You, you choose from what is best about philosophies and religions um, across the board take what is good to advance those goals. And, you know, if if I'm standing next to a Mormon and they're, you know, making the world a better place, great. <laughs> Keep hoisting those sacks of beans. <laughs> We're, I'm all for it. Anyway. Uh, okay, we need to move on to other people. we got a lot of hands up still um but i do want to point out uh with the humanist community for quite a while we had we were volunteering i think for a local food bank we had a, a group that was doing it uh wasn't super popular i don't know much about it i didn't do it so if somebody knows more about the that particular event or group of events uh they can jump in but uh we have helen uh has a question um, two quick things. One is that this thing about the word intelligent means that if these, if the religious people are terrified of having their, the kids learn this stuff, it's because they don't think they're, they don't trust their intelligence to understand that there are differences. <laughs> and, I'm not sure, Helen. Could you, I, I, I'm well, not sure I understand your comment. Well, what I mean is, um, they're claiming that some higher being was intelligent enough to do such and such, but but if they're afraid for their kids to learn comparative religion, 
then then they don't have a lot of faith in their own kids to understand these differences and appreciate them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the other, I, I don't. I haven't yeah. heard the intelligent design people making comments about. Um, uh, comparative religion in the curriculum. It's generally the young earth creationists who have been uh, in opposition yeah. to that. Yeah. As I the say, other... the, yeah, the intelligent design people are kind of a subset of creationists, and they tend to leave out a lot of stuff. The other thing was what was said about the uh, human um, uh, operations is also the um, the eating department and the speaking department are too intertwined too. You can choke on something. Yes, I think that's right. Ah. That's right. What 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 self respecting primate walks on two legs, I ask you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have Jay, Jay McDiamond. Hi. Hi, Jay. Um So thank you, Matthew, and thanks for putting this on. Uh, Jeannie, it's always fascinating to hear you talk about this. It's it's a a fascinating talk. Um, So Matthew raised the question earlier uh, about um, Xenu, and that is alien life wrapped in a you know religious blanket. Does it concern you at all that given that there are a number of people who believe in science? who believe in this idea of alien life and wrap that in a lot of science, um, that there could be an attack on teaching evolution um, as a, um, uh, using alien life as another form of intelligent design. As a matter of fact, the, um, the intelligent design proponents have, um, have been offered, shall we say, um, uh, support in their efforts to uh, um, uh, well, I would put it in terms of ducking the First Amendment because <laughs> the idea that there could be intelligence involved, but not God, yeah. not God, maybe a time traveling uh, biochemist, you know, that that's likely to happen. Um, and this is from the um, oh God, it's the Jay, you're Canadian. Um, what's that? Canadian group. Oh, that name has just gone out of my brain right now. Senior moment, folks. Um, there's a Canadian group that believes that, in fact, uh, human beings are the descendants from um, from uh, 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 from as- aliens, aliens from outer space who came and visited the planet, uh, you know, millions of years ago, etc. Planted the seeds. I. <laughs> It, it's on the Don't blame all that. Canadians for this one, please. No, <laughs> no it's actually okay. a, a French Canadian, if that helps, uh, who came up with this. Um, and it, it's, no, but that's uh, exactly what I'm talking yeah, about, yeah, yeah. right? Well, wh- what's amusing is that the the um, uh, the intelligent is that the folks at the Discovery Institute, which is the major uh, intelligent design uh, headquarters, if you will, for this movement in the United States, they dropped this like a hot potato. They didn't want to have anything to do with these people whatsoever. They were sort of like, wow. "Stay away from us. You are <laughs> you are totally uh, devaluing our movement to to be confused with nutcases like you." So, wow. yeah, it's uh, be be careful of your allies, as it were. Although they were saying exactly the same thing that the intelligent design people were saying it's it's totally um i wish i could remember that so in the chat uh lawrence drops uh asks if it's raelians thank you raelians the follower of rail r-a-e-l you can look up rail it's just wonderful i mean they they really have so many thank you very much chat i think greg uh, dropped a link to the wikipedia page for it yes yes oh i love the internet (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> with all the senior moments, I tell you, it helps me a whole lot. Is this true, my friends? Is this true? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you, Jay. Okay. Uh, Dana and Jerry. There you are. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Um, so you had one page that talked about the attributes of uh, science, including things like uh, peer review and publication. Um, I've been a climate activist for a long time, and occasionally I deal with climate deniers. And basically, some of the climate deniers say that all those attributes are just used to exclude dissenting opinions. 
Have you had that experience? I've with, heard uh, that. I, I've heard from that. ID. Have you heard that people arguing for intelligence design, arguing that science is not that good for those sure. reasons? Sure. It's, okay. um, the, the, the way the argument is usually couched is that uh, the, the hegemony of the establishment, uh, the establishment, which is all evolutionary, uh, supports an anti-intelligent design perspective. Therefore, we can't get a fair shake. And a lot of times when I'm at, um, when, I, when I've lectured before university audiences, I will, uh, uh, I will ask, you know, if, hello, excuse me, I lost you, sorry. I would ask, um, raise your hand if you've ever submitted a paper to a scientific journal. And of course, in that audience, a whole bunch of hands is going to go. And then I would say, keep your hand up if every article you have submitted has been published. And all the hands go down and everybody laughs. Because everybody in science knows that nobody promises you a rose garden, right? I mean, you, you do the work, you submit the paper, it gets shredded, all right? <laughs> That's what peer review is all about. It's finding the weaknesses in your argument and finding where you might have missed something. So you have to go back and rinse and repeat and redo some component of your study and try to come up with a better explanation and then resubmit that paper. It's not an easy process. Nobody said that peer review is easy, and it's not, you know, it, it, if they'd even try, if they'd even try, they would have more credibility in making that claim. But they're not even trying. You know, the general way you get into the scientific literature is, first of all, you take your new idea to a scientific meeting, because the rules at scientific meetings are much um, much, much less. You don't have to have everything understood fully to give a paper at a scientific meeting. You just have to have a, generally a coherent abstract, frankly, is all that's needed. And meetings are the place where you try out ideas with your scientific or scholarly peers. And I say, I have, Jeannie's got this great idea, here it is. And then my colleagues would say, hmm, you know, well, have you tried this? Have you tried that? Yeah, I didn't try that. I haven't tried that. I'll try again. And other people say, Jeannie, that's a really interesting idea. Let me work with you on that. And we get a group of people who are all working on this wonderful idea that Jeannie had. And then we come back in the next year and then we say, okay, here's three of us who are going to give papers on the same wonderful idea that Jeannie had last year. What do you think this time? And we'll get the feedback from our peers. And then after, you know, we'll refine our ideas and then we'll get together and we'll publish it. We'll, we'll submit a paper for publication and it'll go through that same ringer all over again. It's not like you just throw up idea out to the public, excuse me, out to the scientific public. And if they don't immediately fall on their knees and, and praise you for the wonderfulness of your uh, study, that therefore the establishment is hegemonic and, and keeping you from keeping you from publishing your ideas. That's the way this is. It's, a, it's not a bug, it's a feature. Uh, only the best stuff gets through. And until the intelligent design people start actually creating something that is testable science, they're going to be ignored. I always like to remind people uh, when it comes to intelligent design that there were a couple of good books written that were actually scholarly. Uh, Darwin's Black Box was one by um, Michael B. And the design inference by uh, 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 Dembski was the other one, a philosophical book. And these books were published by um, real publishers. They were reviewed in real scholarly and as well as some popular um, uh, journals. And they were basically criticized. You know, this is where Behe left out this, that, and the other. This is where Dembski didn't think this through here. Now, the proper way of uh, for, say, Michael Behe to have uh, treated the treatments of the of um, his irreducible, complex, irreducible complexity idea would have been to go back and refine the idea further, take the criticisms of his peers to heart, and go back and, and revisit his ideas and, and come up with a better explanation. He never did that. Neither did Dembski with his design inference. And what happened was they just came back with more of the same. And, you know, after a couple of iterations of this, it's no wonder that the scholarly community ignores you because you, ha you don't play the game by the rules. And there are rules, and you're not going to get into place unless you play by the same rules everybody else has. I just um, uh, submitted a paper um, a month or so ago. Actually, we submitted the paper a couple of months ago 
Um, it's on the um, acceptance and rejection of evolution over the, it's a really interesting paper, over the last um, 30 years or so, and how this has changed. And we, we submitted it to science, and they didn't want it. We submitted it to nature, and they didn't want it. We submitted it to uh, proceedings of the National Academy of Science, and they didn't want it. So are we going to just whimper and go back and say, nobody loves us, we're being discriminated against by the establishment? No, you fight, you, you keep fighting, you know, you keep working to find a journal. I mean, those three journals, you, you know, you're in the top 2%, so we didn't have a whole lot of hope for those. But we, you know, we have submitted it to a journal that has accepted it. It's a very good journal um, for the kind of survey research that, that our group did. And, you know, they sent it back, but, but with revisions required, you know, so... We've been through lots of versions of this manuscript. Everybody said the research is good, but the presentation needs to be changed this way and the other way. That's just the way scholarship works. You don't get your nose bent out of shape because you're not immediately embraced by the, your peers in the discipline. And I, I'm afraid we've gone over. I apologize for that, Matthew. Yeah, we've gone over a little bit, so we're going to go into the general discussion and allow everybody to unmute themselves so that we can all give you a round of applause. <laughs> Dr. Scott. Thank you. 